Okay. Um, uh, and with that, I'd like to um, uh, welcome the next speaker. Um, so our next speaker is Benedetta Bolognesi uh, from the Institute for Bioengineering of Catalonia. Um, she's going to be talking about uh, deep indel mutagenesis uh, reveals novel uh, a, um, amyloid beta mutations that accelerate amyloid formation and are likely pathogenic. So. Hi, thank you. Thanks for the kind introduction. Thanks to Fritz and all of his crew for organizing such a fantastic meeting. So my lab has a major interest. Before I start, this works? To pass my slide? Yes. Okay. So my lab has a major interest in protein aggregation, meaning that we spend a lot of time thinking about these type of structures that you will know as amyloid fibrils. And these are really like beautiful and elegant structures. They're basically in massive elongated polymers, like what you see here on the left, where you have an extensive intermolecular beta sheet, and this is built up of like monomers that are stacked, thousands of monomers that are stacked one on top of the other here. Um, and no matter the starting, the specifics of the protein which is aggregating, is it folded, is it uh, intrinsically disordered, it doesn't really matter. It will, if it undergoes the amyloid aggregation pathway, it will end up forming a structure that looks very similar to the example that I'm showing here. And if you now sort of cut a slice of this fibril and look at the cross section of it, this is not working, yeah. You will see how each monomer is structured within the fibrils, and basically each monomer adopts a set of beta strands that are facing each other. And here you then have two filaments that are facing each other to form the mature fibril. And I find them really fascinating, but um, unfortunately, we will find out today why they may not be so, not so elegant after all. They're very stable, and the stability of the structure comes from um, hydrogen bonding on the vertical axis, let's say, and from specific side chain interactions, often hydrophobics, um, on the perpendicular axis. And as I was saying, they're fascinating, but unfortunately, they are also the main histopathological feature in a wide number of human diseases, and they're very common, actually, in most cases of neurodegeneration. Uh, not only, but also mutations in proteins that can form amyloids cause familial forms of neurodegeneration. And, well, this is true for many human disease genes, and we're all aware of it here. Um, we know, we are aware of the impact of just a tiny fraction of uh, these mutations. And today I'll, I'll talk about one of our models. We work on many of these sequences, but this is the one that maybe we studied more extensively in the lab because it's probably the most famous amyloid, which is the amyloid beta peptide, that, um, is the which is the component of the plaques that we find in Alzheimer's disease patients, all of them. On the other hand, amyloid beta mutations also cause familiar forms of Alzheimer's, which makes it a very good um, model to look at. And this means that one single amino acid change in this peptide is enough to cause your brain to go like what you see on the right to shrink down to what you see on the left. And this is how a brain of an Alzheimer's patient looks like after a few years. This is very interesting in terms of disease, but we also have just a more general fundamental question that is how do mutations make proteins undergo the amyloid aggregation pathway and, and aggregate? And one key information about this process is that, yes, fibrils are incredibly stable, but thankfully they don't form all the time because there's a very high kinetic barrier to their formation, meaning that the monomeric peptide or protein needs to overcome this first jump in free energy to reach a transition state where it structures into a first nucleus that then can seed further aggregation. We have a method to track uh, amyloid nucleation. It's a massively parallel method, otherwise I wouldn't be speaking here. And it's um, based on a fusion of any sequence that you would like, but today we will talk about amyloid beta variants. We fuse them to the nucleation domain of what is actually a yeast prion, sub-35, which allows us to have selection. And I'll tell you in 10 seconds how this works. 
SUB35 is a translation termination factor, and in the yeast strains we use, it recognizes a premature stop codon in a gene that is required to survive without adenine, meaning that if the protein is soluble, and I'm talking about SUB35 here, we have a bunch of cells which are just not able to grow without adenine. On the other hand, if we go upstream and we fuse to the nucleation domain of SUB35, a variant of a protein, a variant of amyloid beta, which is like inducing amyloid nucleation and aggregation, this will also foster the aggregation of SUB35, which sequesters the full-length protein, which is not available to do its job anymore. We have a read-through of translation, and suddenly these cells can grow even without adenine. So this is how selection works, and out of this we get, obviously, um, this is a bit slow fitness scores, which we actually call nucleation scores. And why do we call them nucleation scores? Well, we call them so because they correlate incredibly well with rate constants extracted from in vitro aggregation kinetics of amyloid beta. I was particularly happy when we found out that the data was correlating so well with kinetics because um, this is really the one step that you want to prevent uh, if you want to like, avoid amyloid aggregation altogether. It's the rate-limiting step of the reaction. It's the one step that you want to prevent, that you want to understand, and therefore that you want to be able to study. And it's also the one step that is the most difficult to characterize by classic biophysical methods. So what did we do? We built a library of amyloid beta variants, and we decided to include not only single amino acid substitutions, but to expand it to look at insertions, deletions, well, single insertion, amino acid insertions, single amino acid deletions, but also larger truncations or internal deletions to the peptide. And why did we do this? We did this, um, first of all, because um, indels matter a lot. Uh, they cause a big fraction of genetic diseases. They were underlooked for a long time because a lot of alignment methods were not even like, good enough to sort of identify and classify these variants well, so we have sort of forgot them for a, a long time. Um, they're also part of like, the common genetic variation between any two individuals. And then the other reason is that they give us like, some bigger biophysical insights, because we're not playing just with the side chains here, we're effectively reducing the length of the main change. These are drastic changes to a protein or to a peptide, so we're looking at a very diverse set of sequences here, actively generating very different peptides from an amyloid beta wall type. Um, and altogether, it's quite good to look at, in one unique data set, at all these different classes of mutations in one go. And the comparison looks something like this. You see here a distribution of nucleation scores. Zero refers to amyloid beta wall type. Everything positive means that something is aggregating even more than that. And the negative stuff, it means that um, these peptides would be aggregating uh, slower. Uh, Something common among all classes of mutations is that it's generally easier to um, impair or disrupt aggregation rather than incre to increase it, but this is even more evident if you look at large truncations and deletions. These are the last two classes here. Um, while for insertions and substitu single insertions and single substitutions, we have quite a few sequences that can still increase uh, nucleation. And I'll dig a bit deeper in each of these classes now. We'll start from something easy, which is substitutions. This is what we knew about a beta until a while ago. We knew that there were 14 mutations that were causing familiar forms of the disease. Um, then we did sort of like, as a scientific community, 30 years of in vitro biophysics to understand <laughs> that some variants of a beta were increasing aggregation and some of them were decreasing aggregation, but it didn't really help us much to understand the full landscape of A-beta. And then thanks to this massively parallel method, we can now have a full mutational landscape of amyloid beta nucleation. Um, the stuff in blue is here increasing aggregation. The stuff in red is decreasing it. Um, you'll see that this is a non-obvious heat map. You have some very interesting position, very uh, strong sp position-specific effects. You will wonder what the disease mutations are doing. This is data that is published, um, you see how well 
this set of nucleation scores perform as a classifier of pathogenic mutation. This is the red curve, so it outperforms all previous predictors of protein aggregation, but even of uh, variant deleteriousness. And on the other hand, this is what at the time also told us, well, whatever we're tracking in these yeast cells is something that is incredibly similar or incredibly relevant to what happens also in human disease, which gave us the confidence of having a platform that is particularly meaningful when it comes to explaining the mechanism that is leading to, to pathogenesis in Alzheimer's disease. But there's a lot more in, a, in this heat map. You see a very strong difference moving from the N-terminus to the C-terminus with most mutations um, able to increase aggregation being at the N-terminus while at the C-terminus they disrupt aggregation. And this brings me back to the primary sequence of amyloid beta, which I will highlight it here. You see the part in yellow is mostly, is basically completely aliphatic, hydrophobic, um, while the part that is not highlighted here, which is more at the end terminus, is actually charged and polar. So the peptide has a very uh, charged, especially negatively charged end terminus, moving then to a completely hydrophobic uh, C terminus. And we find that mutations that are able to increase aggregation are specifically located in negatively charged residues at the end terminus. And mutations that decrease it are instead at the C terminus, as I mentioned. And this has probably a lot to do with what happens to amyloid beta when it starts to structure to form amyloid fibrils. So the core of these fibrils is built by the hydrophobic C terminus of I beta. What you see here at the core of the fibrils is all of the C terminus of A, D, B, of A beta, meaning that probably side chains here are very tightly packed and therefore very, uh, this area is very, very sensitive to mutations. And then on the other hand, we have this region which is the end terminus, which is exposed to the solvent in the, in the fibrils and it's even unstructured in fibrils. When we look at all the available structure of A beta fibrils, even the most recent cryo-M Alzi from Alzheimer's brains, the first 10 to 15 residues of A beta are completely unresolved. Yet in this region, we find many positions where mutations increase aggregation and are likely pathogenic. Um, and that's exactly what I've just said, just mapping the mutational impact per position on the structure of the monomer within fibrils. You see that a lot of the key positions where we can increase aggregation are actually in this first unstructured region of the end terminus of the peptide, while the ones that disrupt it are in what will represent the core of the actual uh, fibril. If we move to insertions, we'll see that the map is actually somewhat similar to the one of substitution, which is interesting, meaning that there's some common structural signature here with a major difference between the N terminus and the C terminus. Um, there's something else here, which you realize that there's some positions, 33 to 38, where like virtually all mutations disrupt nucleation and we think that this is somehow a signature of an even inner um, core that is incredibly protected where the last four residues of the peptide can tolerate way more mutations, suggesting that they may be accommodate side chains and are more exposed to the solvent. Um, something that I want to point out here is that, you know, there are things that make sense in these heat maps, for example, we look here, there's a bulky tryptophan. Look, it's really not, you cannot really fit it in the core of the nucleating structure. That sort of makes sense. But there's a lot of other stuff that it would have been impossible to predict. And in fact, all aggregation predictors and variant effect predictors fail quite miserably at predicting this data. There's um, many mutations to charge residues that are increasing aggregation. There's a lot of non-obvious things, including insertions of prolines that would increase aggregation. And this is incompatible with um, something that would be tolerated in the core of aggregating structures. You can't really have a proline in the structure that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. So the idea is that maybe these mutations are actually affecting the ensemble of monomeric conformation, conformation also of a beta and favoring nucleation by this way. If we now move to, to deletions, this is a very easy data set to look at because it's just like one sequence, like a, a small set of sequences with one single deletion at each position of the peptide. Again, we have the effect at the C terminus. I will not stress it again. You got um, the idea. But what I want to point out here is that actually the top scorer in this data set is the one known single deletion 
um, that is causing um, familiar forms of Alzheimer. This is a deletion of residue uh, 22. So hinting again, well, now in a more anecdotal way, but hinting at it again at the fact that we are onto a mechanism that is extremely relevant to um, Alzheimer's. And then we move to like removing big chunks of the peptide, either internal or from each side. Let's look at truncations from each side. The C terminus is almost not worth looking at, except that we have a deletion of the last two residues, which give a beta 40, which is the other isoform of amyloid beta, which is common in the serum, but it aggregates a lot less. And yes, it aggregates a lot less. But when we move to removing, you know, chunks of the peptide from the end terminus instead, we have a bunch of truncated variants that are increasing aggregation drastically, including one peptide which includes um, the full aliphatic core plus just one lysine um, at its end terminus, and which is really one of the top scorers in the entire library. And we believe that this is forming a sort of minimal amyloid core, which is a different from the one that we see from a beta wild type and is faster aggregating. And we have validated this independently and it's something that we're trying to understand more mechanistically in the lab. And for internal deletions, so imagine these are all peptides that are missing a chunk in the middle and we can look at them here. So each of these square corresponds to a peptide which is missing some of these residues in the middle. And again, once you touch the C terminus, you are mostly disrupting nucleation. But what this heat map is showing you is that there's actually a hotspot of deletion effect where deletions that are, when, once you are deleting residues 23 to 27, more or less, but even if you're starting a deletion from the very beginning of the peptide, from the very beginning of the peptide, but reaching this region, nucleation is massively accelerated. And that's um, interesting. This corresponds to this region in the monomer, so it's this sort of like loop or turning region that is allowing the third strand to face the first two strands of the core of amyloid beta, if you want to visualize it. Um, and what is more interesting is that if you think that accelerated nucleation is really what would explain pathogenesis, then here we really have a bunch of variants that you kind of want to look, uh, be careful about. And while we were processing this data, a paper came out on science translational medicine where um, they reported a mutation in a Swedish family called the Uppsala mutation, which is carrying exactly the adhesion in this region. So these are in, in these people, these people are missing residues 19 to 24 in a beta, and they have a dominant pattern of dementia in the family. And this mutation is really in the middle of the hotspot of deletion effects. So again, this sort of indirectly confirmed that we were onto something meaningful, but then on the other hand, it also told us that, hey, there's a lot of other deletions here. We're talking about more than 50 internal deletions of the peptide um, that are very likely to be pathogenic. So in this slide, I sort of summarized all the mutational impact that we managed to characterize with this big library, ranging from deletions, insertions, substitutions. Visually, you can already say this massive difference between the N terminus and, and the C terminus. And I'm gonna try to make three main points here to summarize. The first one is that there's many internally deleted variants and truncated variants in the N terminus that are increasing aggregation. And the truncations are particularly interesting because you can imagine that even in vivo, out of degradation or proteolytic cleavage, maybe some of these variants could be generated, not just from genetic mutation, and they could also see the aggregation of amyloid beta. Um, the second point that I want to make is that what we're seeing here is that a lot of the likely pathogenic variants actually have mutations in the region of the peptide that we know the least about. This is the region that is not structured in the fanciest cryo-EMs, meaning that even if we advance a lot in structural biology, this is not going to necessarily tell us a lot about the region that we want to understand, to understand pathogenic variants. Um, while on the other hand, the very structure mutations at the very structure core are all likely to decrease aggregation and are not likely to be uh, pathogenic. And the last point that I want to make is that, well, in relation to this, but also in relation to the current performance of predictors is that 
these type of experiments are therefore very badly needed because we're not very good at predicting what mutations do in disorder regions, and we're not very good at predicting the effect of insertions and deletions in general. Uh, I'm not gonna go through a bunch of bad correlations, but these are just some like famous predictors of protein aggregation. They all perform extremely poorly on insertions and deletions. This is unfortunately true about many variant effect predictors, meaning that the one way to go after this problem at the moment for me is to do um, the experiment to look at these systematic libraries, include indels, and look at what happens also in regions that are very much out of the structure amyloid cores. This work was led by Mireya, who is just wrapping up a fantastic PhD in my lab. She went through a number of plates that I think I would be embarrassed to mention here, um, and is really like a fantastic student. I will also acknowledge the rest of the lab. We have a common interest in understanding the transition state of amyloid nucleation that we share with Andre Faure and Ben Lehner at the CRG. At the moment, we have so many of these amyloid projects that we really cannot keep up in terms of hands and brains. So if you are interested in this and would like to live in Barcelona, please get in touch. done any work in, on the human genetic side to see whether some of the variants that you might predict would be protective, whether they are associated with lower Alzheimer's risk? Yeah. Um, uh, as far as I know, there is like one protective variant. It's like A2T or A2V, if I'm correct. And just from looking at our single substitution, we I don't think, I think I can go, maybe, no, I cannot go back. We can have a look later, but I, th I thought, if I remember well, it wasn't so convincing, you know, but also it's like an equal one. So this is a variant that I think it's common in Iceland and it's protective, but it's definitely a good idea even like to expand this a bit more and see if we have anything else. Yeah, thank you. Yes, absolutely, thank you. Great talk. Uh, this is a technical question. Do you know by chance what was the promoter and the copy number of your plasmids that you expressed? Yeah, so it's a copper promoter. Mm -hmm. So inducible. Uh, yeah, so we have even tested the, this like playing with copper concentration and this, we decided uh, like on a, on a certain level. The copy number, <laughs> I don't know. But the reason I'm asking, I'm sure you know. I'm, I'm pretty sure, like, we always try to work with, like, single copy number, like, not to have, yeah. like, any issues. So I don't see why we would have done anything different here. I'm but. just curious if the expression levels change your results, like, linearly, or yeah. is, is there some, because some proteins are known to aggregate just by overexpressing them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we have, I mean, this is a very easy experiment to have in mm -hmm. the lab, like, we can double the copper concentration and see how the heat map changes, you know? But like, we have also like a bunch of negative controls that are like, supen alone doesn't aggregate and other sequences do not aggregate at this exact concentration. So I think like in this current setup, it's very well controlled Robert. for, but it's a good idea to throw in with a higher concentration and just see what happens there, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Hi, um, I really enjoyed your talk. Super Thank you. cool. Um, I, I'm wondering what your thoughts are as, as far as like, you know, one could imagine doing all of these perturbations to every single protein, but at, at some point there's gonna be like diminishing returns, you know? So what do you think are like, in, in terms of like indels and truncations and whatnot, mm -hmm. what would you prioritize? You know? Yeah, so my way to prioritize this is because I'm like, so um, attached to amyloids that I really sort of would like to scan everything around the amyloid cores. So even when we talk about like very large proteins, I would sort of like focus on, on their cores and the regions around them and like play with truncations and, and insertions there. Also because I think it's going to tell us something very interesting on the mechanistic aspects of how these things end up going, forming amyloids. Um, I get your point like more generally as in, like, are we just gonna build these massive atlases and some point see if we understand something or are we gonna put some criteria? Uh, it's, it's also in, in thinking about how can we like um, minimize the library sizes so that we can like, you know, start like exploring the interesting parts of the perturbation spectrum and not. Yeah, 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 yeah. So 
the amyloid course allows us to like focus on regions and then I would just sort of go with like amino acid types like you can sort of choose what happens if I put an hydrophobic or a charge and reduce this in, in this way. But I don't have any more clever answer than this. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, so we have some questions online. Yeah, so a few online questions. Um, so um, Matt asks, are these mutations often homozygous and would the fibrils form with wild type and mutant monomers? So mixing like half wild type and half um, mutant. What yeah, so the that? mutations that I showed you are um, um, all dominant, actually. Okay. Yeah. We have some work in the lab um, trying to figure out what happens when we have you know, a wild type sequence and a mutated sequence. So we're trying to engineer a system when we work with more than one plasmid that can play with different mutations to see to which extent uh, cross seeding happens. In vitro, we know this can happen, but it's not always both ways, and it's not for all variants and, and, and amyloid beta wild type. But there's evidence of cross seeding for amyloid beta mutants and, and wild type. And that's also why I brought up this point of truncated variants that could be generated for whichever reason and aggregate faster than wild type, but then end up seeding the aggregation of, of the wild type sequence. Right. Um, so how much does the stability of the aggregate matter, right? So is it just that you overcome this energy barrier, but then after that, how much does the actually actual stability of that complex matter for disease? Yeah, so if you ask me, I don't think it matters a lot, um, because once you reach that point, um, it's almost impossible to go back, you know? Well, you could, I suppose you could go back if you generated another, like, a competitive stable state that can slowly take away stuff from the aggregate, because most of the monomeric material will be in the fibrils, but it's true that there's always a bit of like soluble monomer around, and that's the critical concentration that you need for aggregation, actually. And so if suddenly you start to shift the equilibrium towards that, but it's a very, very difficult process and very rare. So I don't think that that stability matters so much. And it's a massive stability because the network of hydrogen bond is so big there that it confers, these structures are like rocks, really. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's a few more questions in chat. Um, if you're so inclined, you can go on Vimeo after. Yeah, we, we should. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so let's thank uh, Sanjana again. Thank you.